My name is Anita Wharton. Hidaya Mohadin. Sheila Ravadia. Uh, my name is Prafula Shah. Yeah, Raki Shah. First name is James. My surname is Ojomo. Uh, my name is Shivam. Surname Kakad. My name is Anita Wharton. I was raised and born and raised in Brent, born in Harlesden, uh, spent most of my life uh, living in Chalk Hill, uh, around the corner from Chalk Hill Estate. Had a great family life out there, um, amazing. Um, I haven't really left Brent, I live in Wilsden at present. Before I had my transplant, um, I had a normal life, nine to five, take children to school, do the school run shopping etc. Um, I had no prior symptoms um, to being diagnosed. I just got really ill and collapsed one day um, in 2014. Um, ended up in hospital uh, to find out that yeah my kidneys had basically failed and I needed to go on dialysis. Obviously um, it affected my work life. I couldn't work anymore. Um, so it's kind of Going from doing a 40 hour week at that time, I was a manager for an optical company, to being at home 24 seven. Organ donation was always on the cards. Um, unfortunately, all of my brothers and sisters are diabetic, apart from myself, which means none of them were able to actually offer me a kidney. Um, so then it went out to be a deceased kidney. Um, and that was always on the cards. It was just a matter of time and the the dreaded kidney lottery, as they call it, you know, because you just, there's no time, any time you can get a call. I was one of the lucky ones. Um, my donor was a 32-year-old white male, and uh, my surgeon said I couldn't have had a better match unless it was my sister, you know, so I was one of the lucky ones then, but that's not always the case. You kind of live your life also on a standby, you know, you can't really plan too far ahead, you can't go on holiday just in case you get that call, you know, you don't want to be too far away from home just in case you get that call. So it is, it's a kind of Russian roulette sort of thing, you're waiting and just hoping that the next one's yours. Now I'm well, uh, it's been six years now, um, very well, trodden on with life, getting on with it, happier for a, I call a second chance, so yeah, I'm enjoying life. Someone knows someone who knows someone who needs a transplant, who's had a transplant, and um, how diabetes is rife, especially in the black community. You know, diabetes attacks your eyes and then your organs, especially your kidney. So we are becoming higher on the transplant requirement list, but not higher on the donor list. So there in itself is a, 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 a mismatch and causing quite a lot of issues um, and leading to a lot of fatalities. You know, there's a lot of people waiting who never get that chance to actually get a transplant. I think it was um, very tiring for her. She was drained the majority of the time. Um, I'd say she kind of lost herself. She was very much depressed. And it was just, yeah, tiring. She would go in three times a week. She'd have four hour sessions. And her blood pressure used to drop a lot. So that was one of the complications she faced. So she just was weak a lot of the time. It was. It was quite sad because I felt like she lost herself and we then kind of lost our mum in a sense because she wasn't her cheerful self, she wasn't proactive. Was it felt like we switched roles, if that makes sense. I felt like I was the mum. I was 14, going on 15. So we all rushed <laughs> to the hospital. Well, actually, she got the call twice. The first time we were at the hospital, but then there was some sort of complication, I think. No, the, the kidney at Prankers they were waiting for, the person that actually made it, which is quite sad to wish something bad on them, but that meant that we had to go home. The change was actually very instant. When she had her surgery, the minute she came out, I felt like I saw my mum again. Like her physical appearance, her colour had come back to what it was before. Um, after her, the recovery, she was very energetic. She became outgoing again. She just slowly but surely became herself. The life of the party, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> honestly. <laughs> so she didn't only just get a kidney, she got a pancreas as well for a better quality of life. 
and that's exactly what it did. She became her normal self again. Like, she was just bubbly, funny, very outgoing, wanted to do much more with her life. Whereas before, when she was on dialysis, she was very homebound. But she just wanted to travel, do more, like just be out. So my mum was very careful with, even in our culture, what we do is if someone's sick, we go to visit them in the hospital. So she had to stop doing that. She kept herself to herself. She was very guarded because she saw it as, okay, I've got a second chance at life. I'm not gonna mess it up. So she was very much, much conscious of being around those that are sick, but she just wanted to be in the best of her health. Well, I think a lot of people did tell her not to get the um, organ donation, but we did our research and it does say in, it's, it does say in our religion that it is allowed if need be and she clearly needed it for a better quality of life like she was having a horrible time of dialysis so she knew she didn't want to just stay on dialysis so she was very much eager into getting an organ or organs <laughs> it is our community that's unfortunately getting these health risks and having a lot of complications so we have to be the ones doing the talking to let people know like yeah there's help out there even in our religion, it says, if there's help, do you get it? When we went back home for a holiday, they were in disbelief that my mum even had a pancreas transplant. They're like, no, that doesn't exist. Like, so this, it's literally down to lack of education. I lost my mum uh, last year, last year at 45. The current position of Islam uh, in relation to organ uh, donation, organ transplantation, is based on fatwas or edicts, which are Islamic rulings by scholars who are learned in the subject. The latest one is from uh, Mufti Mohammed Butt, who in 2019 produced a fatwa from Bradford, in which he made organ transplantation uh, and donation permissible. Um, and that's, the, that's also now been replicated by several other uh, scholarly edicts um, and so the current Islamic position is that organ donation although it's up to the individual but Islam uh, makes it permissible. Look it, it's not an easy conversation it's quite a difficult conversation I think that people find it difficult people find it difficult to talk about death and people definitely find it difficult to talk about organ donation but as we clearly know that it's a, it's a discussion that we need to have and a discussion that we must have and we at the Central Mosque of Brent are opening up that discussion. Um, we're having open days, we're going to have uh, Q's and A's, and we're going to open it up to the Imam, where we are going to bring up the topic and say, this is something that you need to consider. We're not making a decision for anybody. What we're doing is we're, make, we're opening up the discussions for them to say that this is something that you need to consider. This is what the legality from an Islamic point of view is. You have to then make your own decision. In terms of deceased donation, uh, last year there were um, 1,397 people who their families said yes to donation and they were able to become uh, donors. Uh, that gave rise to just over 4,000 uh, life-saving and life-transforming uh, trans uh, transplants. In terms of being matched for a uh, to receive a, uh, an organ uh, transplant, uh, the, mo the way you get matched most commonly is associated with the ethnicity that you come from. So you're most likely to receive an organ from someone from someone of a similar ethnic background. Uh, so, um, um, unfortunately, in the UK, uh, you are more likely to get an uh, an organ transplants quickly if you are of a white background so statistically you are if you're of a white uh, background you are almost twice as likely to get uh, a deceased donor transplant uh, each year because of your background as opposed to the other ethnic groups. My dad um, became an organ donor about five years ago so he was a larger than life character, um, a love 
you know, he's very loud, love joking around and, uh, you know, talking to new people, learning new things. So about five years ago, he became critically ill. Um, there was a point where we knew he wasn't going to make it. And uh, this is the point where the specialist nurse approached us to ask if we would like my dad to become an organ donor. And me and my brother instantly said yes. Um, it seemed like such an obvious answer for us based on um, knowing my dad's personality and how privileged he would feel um, knowing that he would be able to save lives after his death. So um, and, and literally minutes after the specialist nurse told us that my dad had actually registered um, to become an organ donor himself through his driver's license which then ping something in my head to say, oh, I was the one who helped him fill out the forms. And we had the discussion regarding organ donation. Um, and yeah, my dad went on to save two people's lives by donating a kidney and liver. Knowing that he had registered actually gave us that peace of mind to know that, oh, we had completely made the right decision, you know, on his behalf. My dad was diabetic and due to that, he had heart disease high cholesterol, high blood pressure, <laughs> um, um, and we found that he was actually, um, had the ability to donate most of his organs and tissue. So after my dad, um, after it was confirmed that my dad would become an organ donor, family and friends started to find out, and a lot of people did confront us and say, why had we made such a decision? Um, and then once I did explain as a family we had made the decision, they were reluctant to potentially consider a decision like that for themselves um, because they didn't have all the information or they were scared or they didn't understand how organ donation um, works with their religious beliefs. And once um, we had addressed them, m majority of um, my family and friends and community members were willing to actually register on the NHS organ and tissue donor register. So Shakti, my niece, was born with uh, only one kidney and that also didn't function to capacity. So we'd known as a family for a long time that Shakti will need some help at some point, either with a transplant or to go on dialysis. We were told um, by her doctors that she may need this by the time she's about 12 or 13. Um, in Shakti's case, actually, this happened when she was 24 years old. And in the summer of 2017, her kidney function went down to 6%. And it was at that point that we had to seriously think about what are the options for Shakti. So um, we come from the South Asian community and in our community, we can wait up to one third longer than the indigenous population of this country. And what that means is Shakti could have waited for any time up from one year to seven years for a kidney to come forward from a deceased donor. Uh, but luckily with kidneys, there is another option uh, which is that you can actually donate a kidney while you're living. So we wanted to give Shakti the best shot at, um, you know, the transplant. And very often, a uh, transplant from a living donor works a lot longer, and the chances of rejecting, um, you know, transplant being rejected are a lot less. So that was actually the preferred option. And as a family, we had already discussed this and decided that a number of us would do the test to see if anyone was a match in our family. Uh, we did the test. Nobody was a match in our family, including myself, and none of Shakti's friends were a match either. But the option that we did explore was the UK kidney sharing scheme, whereby people that don't have a direct match can go into essentially what's a computer program and the program is run four times a year. People go into the program from all over the country and those people will be people who have someone willing to donate for them, but they don't have a direct match in the family or in the friend circle. And we were in that situation. So we went through the kidney sharing scheme 
Uh, and that's how actually we did find a match the first time the computer program was run. A match was found and three months later surgery happened. In fact, in fact six surgeries happened around the country. There were six people in our chain. So I think what I was thinking about was actually I can, having found out a lot of information um, about this, I found out that actually I can live a perfectly normal life with one kidney, one healthy kidney, and that's really important. If I can live on one kidney, why not? Let's donate one and you know give Shakti the future she deserves. I'm, I'm absolutely fine four years after the uh, donation. I mean, I'm not going to climb Mount Everest or anything, but you know, I, I am doing absolutely fine, living a completely normal life. Went back to work after six weeks, as did Shakti actually. Um, and we were both discharged from the hospital the same day on day five after the surgery. So um, I think it's, it's a lot of people's kind of fear is what will happen to me afterwards. I've had a lot of people ask me actually, does it not worry you? What if your remaining kidney uh, fails? Well, if it fails, then I'm on the transplant list as was Shakti, right? Both in the Jain and Hindu faith, particularly, uh, doing something good for others is considered to be seva. So benevolence is given right up there as a principle in both faiths. And so we encourage many more people to talk about this as a form of seva. Uh, you can make your decision, uh, although the law change in 2020, uh, May 2020 means that automatically all of us are donors, unless we opt out of that system. But if we make a definite decision and register ourselves, but share that decision with our friends and family, it gives them that assurance that should that ever happen where they, they have the opportunity to make that decision, it will be so much easier because they know that was your wishes and they can respect those wishes. I was born in Kenya, Nairobi. Uh, moved here when I was very young um, and then raised in Preston Road area in Brent. Went to high school, my primary school was here. My journey started um, in my 20s when I was diagnosed with a condition called lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, when that flares, it attacks your organs. In my case, my kidneys were being attacked and gradually over the years, my kidney function used to deteriorate. Um, it came to a point where my kidney function was very low and I had a discussion with my doctors whether to have a kidney transplant or go on dialysis. At that time, unfortunately, no one in my family or my friends were a donor match for me. We, didn't, we weren't compatible with the tissue or um, the blood type. So then I was put on a deceased waiting list for kidney transplant. Um, I was on the list for approximately two years. Um, I received the call July 2021, which was last year. Um, saying that they found a match for me. So I went straight to the hospital. Um, they did all the checks that they were required to do. And I was transplanted last year, July, 2021. The procedure takes approximately five to six hours. Um, you're under general anesthetic. So it's just after waking up, you feel like something's just lifted above you. Um, I can't really explain what that feeling is, but it's like receiving a new life. But yeah, it was life changing really, um, it's a true mir miracle, actually. Having received a kidney transplant, my whole life has completely changed. It's transformed, actually. Um, I can see my family and friends. I can go on holiday, which I wasn't able to go on before. And like, that's actually going abroad as well. Um, just general tasks you take for granted, I can do. You know, I'm not restricted on any food. I can eat pretty much everything. Um, I can do any sporting activities. Um, I can just live my life like a normal human being. It's amazing. But within the Asian communities, organ donation isn't really discussed as much. So it's really important having a conversation with your family and friends. I'm quite lucky because my family and friends have supported me throughout my journey. They were even volunteering to give me their kidneys um, to see if I was a suitable match. To the best of my knowledge, uh there is nothing in the Hindu scriptures um, that prohibits the practice of organ donation. In fact, we know that our scriptures, our spiritual leaders, they encourage what we call dan or donation. 
They encourage seva, serving others. Our spiritual leader, His Holiness Pramukh Swami Maharaj, often says, in the joy of others lies our own. It becomes clear that actually, despite our best efforts, someone is coming towards the end of their life, then we consider the possibility of organ donation. People have made a definite decision, and if that's the case, then they might have recorded that on the organ donor register. And that's a really helpful thing for their family and indeed for the team of people who are looking after them because we know what they would have wanted. If they've not made a definite decision, then we'll ask the family, what do you think they might have wanted in the circumstance? The family who have agreed to donate and have been part of this process will eventually get some information about what's happened to their loved one's organs. And that can sometimes be a real comfort to them. They'll know that although their loved one has died, they've made a huge difference to someone else. Maybe they know that their loved one's heart still beats in someone else, for example. Well, it started from back home. I noticed I play squash a lot. I noticed I was always having consistent back pain with swelling feet. I didn't know what it was. I just felt I was retaining fluid. Um, it went on and on until one night I went to bed, slept, and I'll tell you this, it sounds funny. I didn't wake up, I was unconscious for almost five, six weeks. Now the question is what happened? While I was sleeping, I had a stroke. I had a brain hemorrhage. So I was unconscious for that long period of time. I had a very long sleep. <laughs> so when I gained consciousness, I was told I had end-stage kidney failure as a result of the brain hemorrhage. That's where my story started. I started with dialysis and um, after different sessions of dialysis, I was told the only option available was going to be a kidney transplant. So it was a very long journey for me. It wasn't funny at all. You can imagine being tied up to a dialysis machine every other day. You do four hours, 45 minutes, three hours, 45 minutes, three hours. At the end of the session, you're tired, you can't do anything. I went through that for over five, six, seven years. I thought I'd won the Euro jackpot. <laughs> I, picked a call, I picked a call and the call on the other end said, is this James or John? I said, yes. Well, I'm blah, 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 calling from Royal London Hospital. We're happy to inform you that we have a kidney, a perfect match. You are the only match. That was another miracle that happened on my part. I'll tell you, I've had instances of where people have told me, when I die, I need to go back to heaven with my organs complete. And I'm like, excuse me, when you are dead, you are dead. God doesn't need your body in heaven. It's your spirit that matters. I'm sitting here talking to you now because someone from somewhere that God has used came out and gave me an organ. Now, you have a black person who is on, on dialysis, waiting for as long as five, six, seven years. Meanwhile, Caucasians will take like two, three years, if not less, because we've got so many people of their race who have come out to donate organs. Yesterday was a um, Tuesday. After almost 10 years, I went to play squash. I couldn't do it in the last 10 years. I went back to, after 10 years to play squash. So many things. Now I don't even need to sit and think of, um, oh, I have a dialysis session. No. My, it was a complete change in my life. Now I can go out with my wife, my kids. Then I couldn't. I tell everyone the NHS is the best health system. 
people have told me you are wrong, you are wrong. I say, well, if you've gone through what I've gone through, you know I'm saying the truth. Where religion should come in is I expect the churches, the mosques, do whatever, whatever faith it is you believe in, they should come out and tell their congregation the importance of organ donation. They play a very big role when it comes to this. My, I would advise and plead with people, especially people from the black community, to go out. You can check online, NHS slash organ donation. Fill in the form. It takes nothing, but it adds a lot to people's lives. My donor doesn't know me. He doesn't even know if I'm black, if I'm tall, if I'm short. That is where you see organ donation knows no race, knows no religion, knows no sex. It fits anyone. And the people that do it, that come out and give their organs, God bless them. Um, so yeah, sadly back in 2019 it was a uh, bank holiday Monday morning actually from what I remember. Um, and I had just been come home from a wedding, from one of my best friend's wedding. Um, and my mother screamed out at about 6 a.m., which obviously kind of woke me up. Um, and unfortunately, in that moment, my father had suffered a cardiac arrest. Yeah, so this led to kind of eight days in the hospital, um, trying to work on various different things to give dad a fighting chance to be able to come back from it. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the reason for the cardiac arrest was a blood clot. And as they tried to mend him, that blood clot actually traveled up to his brain, causing hundreds of strokes and giving him very little chance to be able to survive. Me and my brother had an initial conversation when we knew dad wasn't gonna make it out of it about, well, maybe we should try and have a positive impact on someone's life when we're going through the worst thing that we could go through. And organ donation seemed to be the way that we can try and make some positive change out of this scenario. Uh, no, we actually hadn't had that conversation as a family. Um, for us, it was really easy to make that decision because it went with my dad's character of being charitable and giving and loving. Um, and he was always about that. So we were lucky that we had an easy, easy decision to make, but it would have been just that bit easier and a bit more comfortable if we had had that conversation. Um, but we didn't, so now I encourage everyone else too. I think there's some stigmas and kind of false stories and myths, um, particularly within Hinduism, so I'm a Hindu, so I feel that there's certainly ideas within older generations around organ donation and maybe it, how it doesn't fit within our beliefs of reincarnation. But if you look into the scriptures, if you look into the, the learnings, if you look into the teachings from all of the top um, people within our societies and religions, everyone's in agreement with it. There just, there just is nothing against it. When you actually go through the organ donation process and when they start kicking it off within the hospital, a team of nurses come in to start to speak to other hospitals and see who needs the organ. So even on that day, you're starting to kind of see who could possibly match or what organs are going to where. Um, and we, I think we found out that unfortunately on the day, they couldn't get the uh, liver to, to, the, to the recipient fast enough, but both kidneys uh, were donated. His corneas, number of blood vessels, uh, some arteries, etc. Um, so yeah, his impact was really positive. Unfortunately, his lungs were damaged during his, um, his, his process. Um, but yeah, so they, they managed to have really good impact on, it was two middle-aged people, I think one lady and one man. Um, um, we haven't had contact from them yet, but we know we've had a positive impact on their lives. That was a really important point for my mum because within Hinduism we do an open casket ritual before uh, the funeral. Um, and yeah, we had no, no idea anything had happened to be honest, so they, they're extremely skilled in the way that they do do it so that you don't have that, you don't see it, you don't feel it, you haven't, you haven't got that understanding. They really do keep your loved one 
in looking the exact same way that they did before. At the point of organ donation, the nurses still do reconfirm. Even if you are an organ donor, you've got the card, everything, if you've signed up, the family still can say that they don't want to follow through with that process. Um, and that's a shame. It could, it could be for their own beliefs. And that's why it's really important that you have that conversation with your family and loved ones. So they understand your beliefs. Um, and then they have that opportunity to follow through with it, um, which, which is really important. So my name is Eliza Smith, and I am a specialist nurse in organ donation. And my job role is a little bit different from the other nurses in the hospital, I must say, because instead of looking after sick patients, uh, I look after grieving families. Um, those families who has been told that um, their loved ones uh, is on the end of life care and, and that these families wanted to make a difference um, in their time of grieving. We, I personally would want to make sure that the family is supported in the decision that they have to make. Explore this with the family. Because some, um, some people have spoken about it in the past with their loved ones. Uh, it's just that they didn't get the chance to register it on the organ donor register. And so families, we explore with the families um, regarding this. I, I salute families who are able to make these difficult decisions in that difficult time that they are going through. And it inspires me to see that um, they find their comfort in being able to give the gift of life because maybe they have seen how difficult it is to lose a loved one and that they don't want, they don't want others to go through the same. And I can see families finding the, their comfort, knowing that their loved ones will be able to li uh, leave that lasting legacy of being able to help others who are in need, who are spe specifically uh, medically uh, in need of these very precious organs.